Hi, welcome to the analysis.news. I'm Paul Jay. Uh, we're going to talk about the Democracy Conference, the Global Democracy Conference. President Biden has called with Tom Ferguson in just a few seconds. Please don't forget year end donations. If you're thinking of donating some money at the end of the year, uh, please don't forget we're a 501c3 in the US. We can't do this without you. And also subscribe and share and all of that. Please, we'll be back in just a few seconds. Welcome back to the analysis.news. I'm Paul Jay, and we're going to talk to Tom Ferguson about President Biden's democracy conference. Tom is a professor emeritus at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. He's the head of research at the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Thanks for joining us again, Tom. Hi there. So a very simple question. Do you consider United States a democracy? And and what do you make of it? If, if at some level it is, uh, what's left of it and where is it headed? Lord. Um, all right. The short answer is authoritarian elements have grown a great deal in this system. They were built in from the start, but the environment of the fantastic growth of wealth and the imbalances in wealth. Look, if you do gilded, in the gilded age, you get gilded age democracy. Everybody knows that was uh, hugely a joke. Um, and Okay, for, the, for people who don't know what that means, gilded age, which is some of our younger viewers, because the way history <laughs> his, the, way, the way history is taught in, in, in most schools, kids don't know nothing about history. So just well, I, briefly, what do you mean? Look, I used to begin in my classes by a timeline, and I would have World War I firmly located ahead of World War II, just to be sure. <laughs> but, but the... Um, the short, I mean, that's the period from 1870 on or so in which the first great concentration of wealth that's sort of capped by the merger movement in the 1890s. Um, and, that, uh, and that wealth distribution tended not to change a lot until the New Deal. That's that old Gilded Age. And let me just, if I'm correct, let me just add, where people like J.P. Morgan and Rockefellers they sometimes call them the Vanderbilts. They call them the robber barons. But these families, particularly the, uh, Morgan and the financial sector, really start to assert enormous power in shaping the nature of American government and society. Yeah. No, I, the, uh, my favorite story on that one is uh, Samuel. I can't remember whether Tilden said it or his friend wrote it. Tilden was the guy who lost the 1876 uh, presidential election. It was sort of counted out in a special commission. And Tilden's name, he was a bank attorney in New York, and his name was the Great Foreclosure, um, the slogan. And one of his friends wrote him a note, it's great, um, where he just said, you know, what we need is to put people in office who will not steal, but who will let us steal. In 1938, I think it was, 36 or 38, Roosevelt, President Roosevelt makes a speech and I, I more or less saying that there's a growth of American fascism. And he calls this when you get a sector of the economy of the elites become more powerful than the others in terms of government. That is he called the definition of fascism. And he said the banking sector is becoming that. So, you know, where, where, where's it? I would not. Oh, I would be very careful with that story. Uh, but well, I'm quoting him directly. I understand he said it, but he was, let us say, another couple of years and we got a greater insight into what the nature of fascism was, I think, uh, in Europe in particular. Yeah. OK, well, I think you. Well, whatever. The, yeah. the point there was where where is democracy? And, 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 you know, I guess it's compared to what. But the, as you say, there's Gilded Age democracy. There's the democracy of the. What, the, what Roosevelt was talking about. So where are we? Well, look, after a certain point, um, I don't think any representative institution can protect you against a colossal concentration of wealth. It's just so, it's like a hanging gardens approach. If the first, if they can't buy the first person, they will find somebody in the system to buy 
They will make extensive legal arguments. You can see more and more companies have been suing people who criticize them. Uh, you find not one, but literally some companies have, you know, a hundred or more think tanks being subsidized of one type or another. This type of colossal uh, range and uh, breadth of uh, ability to move, I am very skeptical that you that that um, in the, the mere voting by itself won't so, won't protect you from this stuff. It is, if anything, after a certain point, it compounds the problem. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty dangerous. I'm not uh, I'm not making light of it. Where I the thing on fascism specifically, I think Arthur Rosenberg's old essay, it's not super well known, but Rosenberg was just one of the greatest historians of all time, and he's really worth reading uh, there. Yeah, I, I agree with him that the mobile is the, the use of, if you like, private armies, I'm just going to capsulize it, but you could spin it out a bit, is crucial in fascism, where the state power is gradually pulled out and private armies start to dominate. You have There were people who thought they saw that under Ross Perot. They were wrong, as I said at the time. Um, they were expecting perhaps Trump to turn into that. That didn't quite happen. Uh, and we, you have not really seen that, I think, yet in the USA. You've got disorganized violence, chaos, and all over the place now. Uh, but you don't see organized private armies fighting in the street. But, but why do you need organized private armies? I mean, when the Hitlerite state emerged or the Mussolini state emerged, they were the central state and had the army. They didn't need they may have had some, you know, private goons in the streets in the lead up to it, but they had lots. I mean, no, people don't. I mean, I've worked a lot on uh, Weimar uh, in the 20s and 30s, and I've been in the German records on this and uh, you know, wrote one of the basic papers on uh, corporate influence on German political parties. Um, and no, they there the the private army combat uh in the Weimar Republic was really really basic and so was the whole level of violence i mean here you're talking not 10 20 30 people getting killed but hundreds over some time i mean that, that people haven't seen that in the united states yet and i hope it never will come to that i i um that's why the question about prosecuting say the um capital uh, insurrection on January 6th is so important. Uh, you can't, shouldn't be allowed to storm a government uh, building and try to change the election and get away with it. Um, and, but, um, you know, that's, that, this, we haven't seen anything like the level of violence in that, at least yet. I'm not telling you it can't happen. The thing that doesn't get talked about very much, especially in mainstream media. I know people that follow this are aware of what I'm about to say. But the extent to which the American quote unquote democracy has such undemocratic features so baked into it, and especially at the federal level, the Senate and the uh, Electoral College. I mean, they're fundamentally ways for the elites to control the outcome of political power that have nothing to do with democracy. Okay, I'm I'm I don't disagree with that. How can I mean anybody who can read James Madison gets the point, right? I mean you couldn't be blunter uh, in some of in some of those Federalist papers. Um, that said, let's remember that you know under the American Constitution you were able to do the New Deal, and I immediately concede also that that didn't help reach a lot of people, including nearly all black Americans, although I think as a group they were better off after the New Deal than before, but by nothing like the average white. Uh, but this is to a considerable extent, I think, in other words, the question about how organized is the population able to put its own interests across. This is basically the heart of an investment approach to political parties. <clears throat> you know, either basically... Um, if you it, who sort of picks up the bill for politics in a broad sense, including um, who can sort of like even just 
uh, do something like have an organization to monitor your school board or something like that, if you can, if ordinary people are able to do that, the system will work. Um, you, and if they can't do that, that disorganization and inability to bear costs, it will not work. And if you combine that system of disorganization, um, which is partly the result of folks who are very affluent, just piling on, uh, stirring the pot, if you like, um, then you got a real mess. I, I do think that the, the way to look at the political rules question is always in the larger societal context, and particularly the larger economic context. So what do you make of this thing Biden's organized, inviting all these countries and trying to position the United States as the leader of the democracies against authoritarian Russia, China? Uh, well, I mean, let's begin by observing, I think, for all the problems in the Western democracies, uh, they generally do function differently and better for people than in Russia, say, and mostly in China, too, though the Chinese growth experience um, is a that's quite worth considering just exactly what, how and what was going on there. I think that was a successful state-led growth, and it resulted, and a lot of people expected it to sort of result in more individual freedom. It did not work that way uh, in the end. Uh, but, I, but the fair comparison with China, I don't think, would be Western democracies. It would be India. It would be India. Yeah, uh, fair. Yes. Um, Yes, up to a yes on certain dimensions, absolutely. But and the China, you know, whatever you want, the Chinese on the whole have done a lot better than Indians. So uh, I, I'm not arguing. I I don't disagree, though. I mean, I've been to both, and uh, you know, there are some things that in India that are quite remarkable. But we'll set that. Let's set that just aside to pick back. What's Biden doing? My read is look. Democracy is an honorific term. They're not seriously applying any sort of razor sharp criterion here. It's a, basically a rallying scheme. Um, when our folks tend to, when they say democracy, they usually mean markets. Uh, and um, that's what you've got here an attempt to sort of uh, spiff up. The, for a while, it was globalization, right? I mean, that was, I mean, the, and, and the the American version of that was, you know, free markets under an American umbrella. Um, and that didn't really work too well. It flew of its own hubris in uh, very soon and, um, and because of its own internal contradictions. It, this is essentially, this is classic politics in, um, uh, a not wonderfully salubrious sense, meaning it's 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 rhetoric basically. Um, you know, you'll know it's not rhetoric when uh, you see serious efforts to fix the democratic deficits in the United States that you know you were just discussing. We we've been discussing, and you were mentioning uh, in particular. I don't take that stuff too seriously. Uh, Maybe is this more? Is this whole democracy event? More about making Biden look like the leader of the free world for domestic American yeah, opinion. I don't uh, think uh, I've said, and we are clear in our paper, uh, in the uh, 2020 paper, that the original, uh, the, the American elite tends to believe its own, you'll forgive my plain English, global only here. Um, they were pushing globalization, American style, free markets. Uh, say in 2000, uh, and they still think like that. Um, the plain facts are most of the world isn't buying it uh, one way or the other, and large numbers of and the American the the American led political order has already collapsed in the sense that you're into a multipolar system now. Um, and so when the Biden people lecture everybody about rules and norms, it's like this is a lesson that uh, just comes from another world, the vanished world. Uh, and they're going to have to, they, I mean, I, I, it's getting a little scary uh, the way they lecture the rest of the world on this because I'm not sure they appreciate 
the sort of uh, larger lessons of foreign relations outside of the legal context that has predominated in American uh, law schools and universities when most of these folks who are actually working in the White House became lawyers or students of international relations. It's um, I, not a whole lot of history taught in those things. Uh, and you can just contrast, say, Henry Kissinger's, uh, some of, he had an essay on how the Ukraine crisis would be resolved um, back about 2014. And, you know, it was very different from uh, what everybody else was talking about. It didn't get resolved that way. And I, there was a lot of irony in the way Hillary, you remember when Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton disagreed as to who should be friends with Henry Kissinger. Uh, but Hillary was essentially undoing the Kissinger approach to foreign policy when she was pushing those aggressive moves uh, <clears throat> in the Middle East and elsewhere uh, to push Americans into places where I think it was overreach was overreach this idea of america the free fight for american freedom and so on and so on and democracy most americans go to adults go to work every day and non-unionized who most of them are have no rights at all if you want to talk about there's no more authoritarianism than where you go every day where you go to work yeah more, let's just generalize that point if you have unions barely in existence and allow folks, I mean, what is the percentage in the U.S. now? It's probably under 10 percent, you know, question of how you measure the work. Well, in the, in, in, the pri in the private sector, I think it's like six. Yeah, right. No, no that's right. And um, so I, I mean, this is, if this is freedom, it's, you know, it's um, <clears throat> a very strange kind of freedom. Uh and uh, this it, it's re it's basically political rhetoric and mostly for domestic consumption. Look, I'm out of this. I have since COVID, I have not tried to travel much. Um, I, you know, uh, but I can tell you I've been around before and a, a little bit during. The rest of the world is not sitting around waiting to be led by the United States now. It just isn't. And folks got to sort of take that seriously. But in in Washington, I'm not sure. I mean, they, like officially admitting that, uh, it's just something they don't do. The Republican Party, and certainly most of the corporate, or all of the corporate Democrats, but the Republican Party perhaps has been more open about it, represent the interest of, of big corporations. And, and nothing they, they don't like more then the workers start getting more confident uh, and getting more militant. No. And it's happening. Uh, it's part, you know, they're saying COVID partly, I guess it had something to do with some of the subsidies that, that the Republicans, you know, really didn't like, and they didn't like it, not because it was going to add to the deficit and that's going to be inflationary. They, they never actually care about any of that, or they would actually care about all this money that goes to arms. What they, what, the, what this, let me, just a sec, what they did care about, is that it would break this pattern of intimidation of the workers. It would break this kind of discipline and desperation of workers to work for shitty jobs, for shitty wages. And now the Republicans are going to be saying, well, we told you so, because look what's happening. And is this going to, you know, usher in a period of some kind of savage attacks to try to, you know, shake American workers so they don't feel uh, like Starbucks just got organized, one in Buffalo. There's hundreds of strikes taking place right now as compared to a year or two ago. I think there was like 10. Uh, there is a militancy growing. Yeah, I'm not arguing that at all. You can see a big turnaround in the Teamsters Union or a major upset in uh, who heads the union. Um, no, I, I, I would certainly agree with that. Um, now, th this question of what let's go back just for a second because we actually treat in our paper on the 2020 election in some detail the covid debates in uh, 2020 over as they were passing those bills now exactly as you suggest you could see uh, especially republican congressmen and women saying 
uh, exact. We can't have, we cannot have wages going up. They were perfectly blunt about it. They said it just like I'm talking to you right now or there. Um, the Democrats were sort of mixed. I we treat that uh, I think just perfectly normally. I mean the 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 big um, capital intensive, often high tech, not quite the same thing. Firms don't need, didn't worry very much about uh, low wages in that context. They could work from home and c continue going, and they they went along. Uh, with I mean, you may remember when I, I think I've alluded to the Robert Rubin essay in the New York Times where we wanted a mix of economics and uh, medical folks making policy there. That was quite different from the Trump approach, right, where it was basically a kitchen cabinet um, and then Trump berating his own experts. Um, now, it is, however, troubling, right, uh, how rapidly the Biden administration dis dismantled the COVID protections when they didn't get rid of COVID, um, and that was a pretty that was a movement that had very substantial Democratic Party support. Now that then leads to the question of what's going to happen, uh, as you suggest, in the future. Now my reading is that if you look at the New Deal, <clears throat> as policies begin to collapse, you have to see what people do. Uh, and I suggested <clears throat> in an earlier interview with you that. Um, you know, the big story in the New Deal was not anything any president did, although Roosevelt hoped by not trying to smash it. I mean, he was willing to let the political forces play themselves out. And Biden might do that. I'm not quite sure where, but he's not going to initiate it. Um, there, some, it would have to come from below. But now, you do have t turnover in the Teamsters Union. You do have a movement now in the National Labor Relations Board to redo the Amazon election uh, in Alabama. That's a really big deal. If that election were to turn out uh, this time in favor of the workers, you may see a rash of organizing. And yes, for sure, you see strikes all over. We were, you know, our paper discusses this because uh, I was very strongly supporting efforts to try to study the actual workforce uh, behavior in 2020 uh, when nobody else had any numbers around. We supported a project to uh, start counting. Um, now, um, the question is, what will happen there? I'm not, you know, I, I'm not sure. It does not help that the AFL-CIO right now is looking a bit like the old AFL, meaning it's kind of paralyzed at a moment when you'd think they could uh, be moving fairly boldly. Uh, the you know, Some of the construction unions, for example, you know, have been uh, really not constructive at all on what I would think of as basic working, worker safety issues. And the whole question of masks has been way more disputed in labor than it should have been. Although Rich Trumpka finally just said people need to wear them, and uh, that, but he's gone. And uh, you've got to fight inside the AFL-CIO. You know, you, it's a clear differences between people who will be the next president. Um, they got to resolve this stuff, uh, and they need to get moving. I think, uh, you know, in the '30s. Uh, when the AFL-CIO, pardon me, when the AFL split uh, and the CIO emerged, you know, maybe it'll take that again. I'm not sure. Um, but um, there, right now, uh, there's a vacuum forming. And in an inflationary period where prices are running ahead of wages in general, which I think is clearly true now, you know, with all the qualifications that we, we've done in other interviews about earlier aid to workers, there um, this is very unstable. It's not, uh, it's, that's not to sound sort of like a social science for one second. It's not an equilibrium. Something is going to happen. Well, it's, it's, it's been a long time, I think, uh, 20, 30 years, at least maybe more where there's been a real window for workers to gain some leverage. Uh, globalization uh, really undercut uh, American, Canadian, European workers, but COVID and this uh, shake in the global supply chain and the fact that you, and the, and the increased rivalry with China, uh, you know, you, they can't trust this uh, 
economy so dependent on importing goods from Asia, especially China, but other countries too, yeah. uh, which is going to give, you know, is giving workers some leverage here. And boy, they better take advantage of it. No, I'm not disagreeing at all. Um, and I, there are, I mean, look, just mention a few problems, though, just because um, it's clear to me that in the education system has been really hammered. It was in trouble because of years of defunding and basically relentless Republican attacks, usually financed by billionaires um, for a long, long time. It was already in trouble. And COVID stuck uh, schools with an impossible situation at every level, which was you suddenly had all these new costs, new problems. You couldn't even meet your pupils um, without making everybody potentially sick. And um, I think that the entire education system from top to bottom is in a has slid into a kind of crisis. Higher ed you, is clearly facing serious trouble. Now, there are a lot of strikes in higher education. There's a strike at Columbia University right now, for example, where I think the university um, I mean, is, has behaved uh, not well, uh, to put it bluntly. Um, and, but it's, it's not the only place. There are a whole bunch of strikes at universities. Um, something like 25% of the UAW, as I saw in a, one recent, uh, is now coming out of academia. So we may know, you know, in the UAW has a problem. Its president got indicted, and it's you know kind. Of, it's just one more example of what you have as problems in the American labor movement. Uh, there, um, so um, and, and like the collapse of sectors like education, I think will cause a lot of distress. It it has huge impacts on labor supply. It, and it's doing it right now because every time the COVID revives, anybody who's got a kid has to worry about what happens. But um, if they, if your school sends the kids home or something like that, which they do with dismaying regularity, because they're not, they're not able to fix themselves there. And you also see burnout among the people who have to deal with this. I mean, in a lot of schools, I know it's, even my neighbors say. Uh, the teachers just call in sick on Fridays and things like that. They just can't live with this. Um, so this this type of a system, the segment system collapse uh, is going to lead to labor turmoil, but it could also lead to really big uh, disasters that impact a lot of people, and it becomes politically very fragile and unstable. Well, let me just end by saying uh, what I just said. I'll just say again, there's never been a better time in decades. If you're not in a union, get organized and get one. And if you're in a union, fight to democratize it and make sure the union really represents you, because in a lot of cases, <laughs> they don't. Uh, if you want democracy in the United States, it ain't going to be Biden conferences with empty rhetoric, it's going to be workers getting organized, as, as you keep saying and I keep saying. Anyway, thanks very much for joining me, Tom. Amen. You know, and go on. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Tom, and thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. And again, uh, year end, if you're thinking about donating, please uh, keep us in mind. And thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.